Hey guys, so Seaboom won the last Guess the Card Art Challenge with the card Greed. If y'all want to be able to beat him as he's won twice now, you might have to turn on the notifications. He got it really fast. But yeah, be sure to try and guess the art from this week. Also, we happen to be doing his deck request this week. So if you have a commander you want to see built, just drop it in the comments and we'll see if we can get to it. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Jank Divers, where we dive into the janky side of commander. I'm Isaac. And I'm Brent. Today, we're taking a look at Obzadak Ghost Council, which Seaboom called the boys. So the boys here for one double white and double black for a 5-5 five five legendary creature spirit advisor. When they enter the battlefield, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. At the beginning of your instep, you may exile Obzadat. If you do, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of your next upkeep. It gains haste. So we got a couple things going on in this deck, but the main thing that we thought to do with this card was just to kill people with it as everything else seemed kind of boring. So we wanted to do a sort of like a legendary beatdown plan. We're running some legendary anthems. So Arvad the Cursed, five mana, three, three, with death touch and lifelink. Other legendary creatures you control get plus two, plus two. A lot of Orzhov color legendary creatures are just really efficient for their mana cost. So this is going to make a lot of our creatures just be like super, super efficient for their mana cost and just really be able to beat down people really fast. Day of Destiny, four mana legendary enchantment that gives legendary creatures you control plus two, plus two. Again, the same thing. It helps us with our beat down plan. Hero's Podium, five mana. It's kind of like a uh, sliver legion for legendary creatures. So each legendary creature you control gets plus one, plus one for each other legendary creature you control. The more legendary creatures you control, the bigger all of your legendary creatures are. It also helps us with some card advantage where you can pay X and tap it to look at the top X cards of your library. You may reveal a legendary creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Uh, you put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Next up, we have some more buffs. First up will be the Circle of Loyalty for four and two white, legendary artifact. The spell costs one less to cast for each knight you control. We have like two knights, so don't worry about that part. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one, which is always nice. Whenever you cast a legendary spell, create a two, two white knight creature token with vigilance. The majority of our creatures are legendary, so we're gonna be making a lot of knight tokens with this. Well worth the six mana cost, even if we have to pay it full and you can pay three and a white and tap it to create a 2-2 two -two white knight creature token with vigilance. So it's just kind of like an army in a can for us. Very useful to have. Hero's Blade for two colorless and equipment. Equipped creature gets plus three, plus two. Whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may attach Hero's Blade to it and you can just regularly equip it for four. So it's just a nice buff to our commander as he's always leaving the battlefield and coming back in. This lets us keep him buffed up without having to pay the equip cost every time, which is nice. And it also equips to other legendary creatures if we need to for some reason, just an efficient card in this deck. And then finally, Black Blade Reforged for two colorless, a legendary equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each land you control. You can equip it to a legendary creature for three and any creature for seven. So this, combined with the fact that Obzadat already has five power and you only need 21 commander damage to kill somebody, Black Blade Reforged will probably make Obzadat into at least a, a two-shot kill most of the time but you can easily get it to the point where it'll kill somebody in one hit, I'm sure, especially combined with other buffs. I also wanted to bring up um, these two cards because they're just super, super good with Obsidat out there. So Tome of Legends is a two mana artifact and it enters the battlefield with a page counter on it. Whenever your commander enters the battlefield or attacks, you put another page counter on it and you can pay one mana and tap it to remove a page counter from it and draw a card. Even if you're not attacking with Obzidat, your Obzidat can continue to enter the battlefield every turn with its own ability. So you'll always be able to get at least one page counter on it a turn. So you can just pay one mana to draw a card pretty much as often as you want to. 
letting you draw a lot of cards. Just very good with Obsy deck. Dawn of Hope is along the same lines. For two mana, it's an enchantment. Whenever you gain life, you may pay two mana if you do draw a card. And you can also pay four mana to create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. Whenever Obsy Dat is entering the battlefield, you're gaining two life. Uh, it triggers Dawn of Hope, so you can pay two mana to just draw a card. It also lets us get out some 1-1 one, one soldier tokens with lifelink, which not only trigger Dawn of Hope by themselves, some of our non-legendary anthems or other cards that make cards really big, those 1-1 one, one soldiers basically let you always have a creature. Next up, we're gonna have some historic payoffs. Just to explain what historic means real quick, all artifacts, any legendary card in all sagas count as historic. So obviously we have a lot of legendaries and we have quite a few artifacts as well. So historic cards are just really efficient for us. Next up is Thran Temporal Gateway. Four colorless for a legendary artifact and you can pay four and tap it. And you may put a historic permanent from your hand onto the battlefield. So this just lets you cheat out some of our more expensive legendaries way faster than you'd be able to normally. Weatherlight, four colorless for a four five legendary artifact vehicle with flying. Uh, it has crew three, which means you need to tap at least three power of creatures to be able to attack or block with it. And whenever Weatherlight deals combat damage to a player, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a historic card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is a really good card advantage engine as we already are attacking a lot. It counts as legendary, so it's gonna get all of our legendary creature buffs. And it's really hard to interact with as it's not a creature when it's not crude. So sorcery speed removal won't get it most of the time. It's immune to most board wipes. So it's just really powerful. Teshar, Ancestor's Apostle for three and a white, a legendary creature, Bird Cleric. And it's a 2-2 with flying. Whenever you cast a historic spell, return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is just really useful for if our creatures just get killed in combat or by removal spells. We can get back a lot of the cheaper ones as we're always going to be playing historic spells basically every turn. We have some very minor sacrifice outlets in the deck as well. So if we need to sacrifice something, we can get it back with Teshar. It's a very powerful card in this deck. We also are running some legendary sorceries. Now, uh, legendary sorceries, we can only cast a legendary sorcery if you control a legendary creature or planeswalker. Our first legendary sorcery is Yogmoth's Vile Offering. So for five mana, you can put up to one target creature or planeswalker card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It does not have to be your own graveyard. And then you also get to destroy up to one target creature or planeswalker, and then you exile Yagmoth's Vile Offering. So this is just a pretty good tempo swing for uh, getting back one of our legendary creatures, or if somebody else has a bigger batter creature, you can get that out of their graveyard and put it onto the battlefield under your control. And then you just get to destroy anything. So if somebody has like one super annoying blocker or uh, one big threat, you can just blow that up and then really just uh, makes a big tempo swing. Urza's Ruinous Blast. For five mana, you can exile all non-land permanents that aren't legendary. Most of our permanents are in fact legendary. So usually this isn't going to hit very many of our cards at all. It's not gonna get your opponent's commanders uh, which is unfortunate, but it's usually going to get a lot of other people's uh, normal creatures and artifacts and mana rocks and stuff like that. It's going to be mostly one-sided, not entirely one-sided, but it's still, we thought it was really good and worth playing in this deck. Primeval's Glorious Rebirth for seven mana. Return all legendary permanent cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So again, most of our permanents are legendary. Anything that has been uh, blown up in the past, as long as it's still in our graveyard, we just pay seven mana, get them all back at once. Can really swing the game if the game has gone on for a while. You have a stacked graveyard, just very good. So next up, we have a card that you know we've never put in a deck before on this channel, which would be Helm of the Host. So it's a four colorless legendary equipment. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, uh, you probably know what this does as we've had this in every video, but I'll read it anyway. 
you create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except that token is not legendary, if it is, and that token gains haste for an equipped cost of five. So this obviously can let you make more obsidats. You kind of lose the blinking ability, as if you blink a token, it just kind of goes into nothingness, but you still would get the two life trigger, and it's a five five, which is nice. They have haste. We have a lot of other legendary creatures that are probably better to copy than our commander though. Probably the most powerful interaction we have is with Thalia's Lancers. So for three and two white, a four four human knight with first strike, and when it enters the battlefield, search your library for any legendary card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So this obviously isn't just creatures. You can get Helm of the Host, which is what you'll be tutoring up a lot of the time. As if you equip a Helm of the Host onto Thalia's Lancers, you can just tutor out any legendary card every combat. If people don't have removal for that, it's gonna like spiral out of control really fast. But if you don't have time for that kind of slow game plan, then Thalia's Lancers can grab any of those legendary sorcerers that we just talked about, uh, can grab legendary artifacts, obviously any of our creatures and there's a ton of options for that so we can't go over everything but it's an extreme this is probably the best card in the deck as it can just tutor up pretty much anything we also have some legendary lands that you can tutor up that you'll see at the end that are pretty powerful as well this card is incredibly versatile our commander also gains us some life every turn so we wanted to put some life gain synergies because a lot of the best white black legendary creatures all have life link or some ways to just gain you some life we're just running some of the best of those. So Campbell, Council of Allocation, three mana, two, three. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, that player loses two life and you gain two life. Kokosho, the Evening Star, six mana, five, five flying. When it dies, each opponent loses five life, then you gain life equal to the life lost this way. So you're gaining a massive chunk of life this way. Tamaret, Chosen from Death, two mana, two star, where star is equal to your devotion to black. And this card is also our graveyard removal. Uh, we believe that every commander deck kind of just needs an answer to everything, but obviously this is dependent on your play group and what kind of decks they're playing. Two mana, exile up to two target cards from graveyards. You gain one life for each creature card exiled this way. It's not a ton of life, but it does help us with our graveyard removal and can gain us some life as well. And then some more life gain payoffs. First up would be Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose for two and a black, a one three legendary vampire cleric. Whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life, so turning all of our life gain into damage is very nice. Commander entered the battlefield trigger will do four damage on its own with this, so it'll add up. And then three and two black creatures you control gain life link until the end of turn. Gains you a lot of life and doubles your combat damage output. Very powerful in a deck like this. Next up is Karlov of the Ghost Council for white and black 2-2 two, two legendary spirit advisor, one of the boys on the card. Whenever you gain life, put two plus one plus one counters on Karlov of the Ghost Council, and then you can pay white black, remove six plus one plus one counters from him, and exile target creature. As long as you can gain life three times, which in this deck, having three separate instances of gain a life is very easy. You can exile any creature you want, and you can do this repeatedly, so you can get rid of a lot of creatures this way. Or just make him really big if that's what you need at the moment. Then Heliod, Sun Crown, two and a white for a 5-5 five, five indestructible legendary enchantment creature god. As long as your devotion to white is less than five, he isn't a creature. Devotion is the number of mana symbols you have. So for Heliod to be a creature, you would need five white mana symbols on your board. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. Obviously really powerful with Karlov in particular, or just your commander. And then for one and a white, another target creature gains life link until end of turn. So obviously a lot of synergy built in there. We also have some ways to utilize our life as a resource. Pana, Butcher of Magan, uh, which for five mana is a 4-4 with Vigilance and Life Link, And it has tap, pay seven life, destroy target non-land permanent. Activate this ability only during your turn. 
So this is sorcery speed, but it's very powerful as we can just destroy anything that's really a threat. So an artifact, enchantment, or a creature, or even a planeswalker, any of those things, you can just pay seven life, blow it up, which when we're gaining as much life as we are in this deck, paying the life isn't that big of a setback. Just having some options that are also like giant legendary creatures going to be very nice. We also have Eily Eternal Pilgrim for two mana. It's a two three with death touch. It has pay one and sacrifice another creature and you gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness. This is very useful if somebody is going to kill one of your creatures that uh, you can just sacrifice that creature to gain life equal to its toughness. So it's going to die anyway, so you might as well pay that one mana and sacrifice it to just gain some life out of it. Because like I said, life is a resource for us. For three mana, you can sacrifice another creature and exile target non-land permanent. Activate this ability only if you have at least 10 more life than your starting life total. Uh, getting to 10 more life than your starting life total uh, is pretty easy. All you have to do is attack with any number of our lifelink creatures or just be gaining life off of our commander or just a lot. Most of our cards will gain us life, so don't worry about that. You just sacrifice a creature, blow up something that's even more threatening, and you're golden. We also have Demon Lord Felsenlock for six mana, a six six with flying and trample. When it enters the battlefield, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card. Then put that card into your hand. If the card's converted mana cost is four or greater, repeat this process. And then Demon Lord Felsenlock deals one damage to you for each card put into your hand this way. We do have quite a few cards that cost fewer than four. So it's not like we're gonna draw our whole deck with this or anything, but sometimes we are gonna draw a handful of cards, maybe four or five, could be very, very good. And it's just a big old legendary creature with uh, flying and trample. Just beating down our opponents is our main win condition of the deck. Uh, he certainly helps with that as well. Next up, we have some card draw creatures. First up is gonna be Timna the Weaver for one and a black and a white, a two, two human cleric with lifelink. At the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you may pay X life, where X is the number of opponents that were dealt combat damage this turn, if you do draw X cards. Yeah, that's why it's partner, but don't worry about that for this deck. This card is like, you gain, what well, you pay one life and get one card for each opponent you attack. So like if you attack three separate opponents and are able to deal damage to all of them, you can pay three life and draw three cards. So you can draw a lot of cards with this and we want to be attacking anyway, so it's just very synergistic with our plan. Mangara the Diplomat for three and a white, a two, four legendary human cleric with lifelink. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. So you will sometimes draw cards off of people attacking you, but most of the value in this card comes out of people casting their second spell each turn. You'll draw like, like you'll draw a card off most people's turn with this, because most people are going to cast two spells a turn. It's very good. Erebos, God of the Dead, three and a black for a five, seven legendary enchantment creature god with indestructible and as long as your devotion to black is less than five, he isn't a creature. Your opponents can't gain life, and you can pay one and a black to pay two life to draw a card. The card draw ability on this card is very powerful. It can be hard to interact with when it's not a creature. When it is a creature, it's a 5-7 with indestructible, which is incredibly efficient. And the your opponents can't gain life is a really good ability. It's not going to come up every game, but the fact that we get it just for gravy on a card that we would probably already play without that is just really nice to have. We also wanted to bring up some of our Haymaker cards. So these are cards that are just going to close out a game super quickly if they're allowed to sit out there. So Elshnorn is seven mana, four seven with Vigilance and other creatures you control get plus two, plus two and creatures your opponent control get minus two, minus two. So it just makes a four power and toughness swing, making your creatures way better than theirs. Any token deck, this just absolutely destroys because then they can't even block your massive creatures because 
all their creatures are dying as they're entering the battlefield. And just very good with aggressive decks like this. God Eternal Aketra for five mana is a three six with double strike. And whenever you cast creature spell, you create a four four black zombie warrior creature token with vigilance. Uh, again, we are casting a lot of creatures, so we're gonna get a lot of four fours off of this. And when he dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, you may put it into its owner's library third from the top. Even if somebody manages to kill this, we can just get it back later and just keep on making tons of four fours. So very powerful. Also Traxos, Scourge of Krug for four mana is a seven seven with trample. It enters the battlefield tapped and doesn't untap during your untap step. But whenever you cast a historic spell, untap Traxos. So basically, if we can cast a spell, we can attack with this giant 7-7 construct. With Trample, four mana is just a great price to pay for a 7-7 Trampler. Just having to cast a spell before you attack with it really isn't that much of a drawback. Next up, we're gonna have some creature recursion as we are an aggressive deck, so our creatures are gonna get killed naturally. So having some ways to get them back is useful. So. First up we have Yomiji who bears the way for 5 and 2 white, 4-4 four, four legendary spirit. Whenever a legendary permanent other than Yomiji is put into a graveyard from play, return that card to its owner's hand. This lets you uh, get back even legendary permanents that aren't creatures, so like if somebody destroys your Thran gateway you can get that back. It does work on the opponent's stuff, but we have so much more legendary permanents than other people do that we're going to be able to make much more use out of this than our opponents can. It's very good here. Athreos, God of Passage, one in white-black for a legendary enchantment creature god with indestructible. It's a 5-4, and as long as your devotion to white and black is less than 7, Athreos isn't a creature. And whenever another creature you own dies, return it to your hand unless target opponent pays 3 life. The first thing about this card is that as a 3 mana 5-4 indestructible, you are hard pressed to find a card that's more power toughness efficient than this. And then whenever the second ability that gets your creatures back from the graveyard unless your opponent pays 3 life is really good, especially if somebody like board wipes you. You can target all of these at the same player who has the lowest life total and they probably will have to give you back something or they'll just be taking a lot of damage. And hitting Devotion 7 is not that hard when our commander provides 4 of that. Next up we have Athreo Shroud Veiled for 4 in white black, a legendary enchantment god creature with indestructible. It's a 4-7 and you need devotion to white and black to be 7 to make it a creature. At the beginning of your end step, put a coin counter on another target creature. Whenever a creature with a coin counter on it dies or is put into exile, return that card to the battlefield under your control. So this lets you protect your creatures from any type of removal as unlike most of these cards, this protects you from exile, which is exceptionally powerful. We also wanted to talk about some of our lands. The legendary lands are especially powerful because our cards that care about historic cards can just uh, get these ones as well. And legendary is just mentioned a lot in our deck. So having legendary on some of our lands is just a nice extra little bonus. So Shizo, Death Storehouse, House for for free. It, it doesn't cost any mana. It's a land that doesn't cost mana. Can you believe it? it taps for a black. Uh, it does not enter tapped, and you can uh, pay one black and tap it to give target legendary creature fear until end of turn. So fear just means it can't be blocked except by black creatures and or artifact creatures. So any of our legendary creatures can just become that much harder to, blo to block. It makes it very powerful in an aggressive style deck like this. Uh, Urborg, Tomb of Yagmoth. Each land is a swamp in addition to its other types. This lets all of our lands tap for a black mana. So our planes are now all uh, dual lands that enter untapped. Very powerful, just super easy to fix our mana with this card. Plus it counts itself as a swamp as well. So it taps for a black by itself. So it's literally just better swamp. Nykthos Shrine to Nyx is a legendary land that taps to add a colorless mana to our mana pool, or you can pay two mana and tap it to choose a color and add to your mana pool an amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion to that color. 
Again, we're building a lot of devotion in this deck. We have a lot of indestructible enchantments like the gods or our commander just gives two to either color to us. Our devotion can be very high sometimes. This can just give us a lot of mana. If not, it's not too bad uh, if your devotion is just uh, two, kind of lets you fix the colors, kind of like a filter land. Next up, we have Vault of the Archangel. So just a land, not legendary. Taps for a colorless, and then you can pay two in white black to tap it and give all your creatures death touch and lifelink until the end of turn, which are two fairly relevant keywords, especially the lifelink for this deck. Useful to have. Castle Lockthwain uh, enters tapped unless you control a swamp. You can tap it for a black, and then you can pay one and double black and tap it, draw a card, then lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. So this helps you draw cards when you're starting to run out on empty. Really useful as this effect is on a land, so you can play it out early and then just let it sit there and draw the card when you need it. And then finally, the greatest card in all of Magic the Gathering. It's gotta be Unholy Citadel, a land. All your black creatures gain bands with other legends. Now banding is one of the most powerful keywords in the entire game. Instead of spreading out all of your creatures so that way uh, they would be harder to block, you can combine them all into one massive creature and attack. Now the reason you would want to do this is uh, if your opponent blocks you, you can split that damage up however you want. In case you didn't get the joke, banding is actually terrible. The only part where it's actually useful is in blocking, where if somebody attacks you with like a massive creature, you can block with two of your creatures, for example, and assign all of their combat damage onto one of your creatures. So it lets you block without having to lose your whole board. In all seriousness, it's just kind of in here because it's funny. It will, it will come up and help you sometimes, I'm sure. And that's going to be it for Obzadak Ghost Council Legendary Tribal. So if you liked the video, please leave a like on it and subscribe if you'd like to see more. And remember to leave us a comment on what you think the card in the background is. And uh, also leave us a comment if you have a deck that you'd like to see built. We like looking at all the requests. And even if your comments aren't getting featured on these videos, we'd really like you to know that we appreciate all the comments and we really enjoy reading all of them. It's fun to see people like to watch our videos. So just uh, thanks for watching all these and we'll see you next time.